Here's what's coming up on your horizon. I know no industry mankind is more dependent upon than agriculture. Yet with less than 2% of Americans involved in production agriculture, it is an industry, the growing disconnect between those who work the land and those who benefit from that labor. Today, we begin our show at the state capitol with some ag in the classroom teachers trying to change all that. I enjoy coming into class and knowing I'm going to get to do some activities with that. If I could tie ag into every lesson I do, then I'm going to be happy with it. Blaine Singletary shows us the art in agriculture. It teaches them that you have to put in effort in everything that you do. We go behind the scenes to take a look at the renovation work underway at the Oklahoma State Capitol. We're putting in marine grade plywood, coating it in paint that will keep water from rotting out this wood, and then it'll get a copper infill to have a nice, good looking finish that will help any rainwater that gets up here flow to the roof drains and down into the storm sewer system. And we'll end our day with my conversation with someone you just may have talked to. I was made that way. I did not speak to Siri myself. It was just too weird to have my own voice coming back here. I talk to myself enough as it is. Stay with us for Oklahoma Horizon. Oklahoma Horizon is made possible by CareerTech. A job for every Oklahoman and a workforce for every company. With additional support from the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food and Forestry. Hello everyone, thanks for joining us here on Horizon. I'm Rob McClendon. Well, since 1950, the number of people employed in agriculture has plummeted in industrial nations around the world. But the declining number of farmers does not imply a decline in the importance of the farming sector. The world, well, it still has to eat. So smaller number of farmers means larger farms and a turn towards mechanization and the inevitable disconnect between those who grow our food and the rest of us that eat it. That's why Oklahoma has been in the forefront of developing Ag in the Classroom curriculum, an effort to teach our youngest generation the role agriculture plays in our lives. The lessons they are varied and very hands-on. And each year, both students and teachers are honored for their work during Ag Day at the State Capitol. And we were there to recognize this year's Ag in the Classroom Teacher of the Year, Deborah Deskin. No bees, no honey, no water. Ag in the Classroom is a way of helping students understand where their food, their clothes, and their shelter come from. So it's teaching agricultural literacy, um, and it's connecting it with the standards that teachers are already teaching in their classroom. So they can make connections to their math, their science, their social studies, language arts. Um, they could tie it into physical education or art education. Raise your hand. How could cherries be brought someplace by birds? How could they all of a sudden start growing somewhere and birds be related so important Ag in the Classroom that. has made it so much it's fun. It's one of those things I enjoy coming into class and knowing I'm going to get to do some activities with that. If I could tie Ag into every lesson I do, then I'm going to be happy with it. We will have 2,001 year Mark Twain. We talked about the history, how the cherry got here. We talked about, okay, how it really got here by birds. So you throw your science in that as well. We did graphing for our math. Um, second grade, that is one of our standards is graphing, so they did a bar graph with it. Talking about George Washington, tying that into President's Day, the old story about cutting down the cherry tree, when they talked about, okay, that really didn't happen. It was just to encourage being honest. So you can actually have some character education with it as well. She's make sure that her students here in Edmond understand about agriculture, even though they're not living on the farm. It's kind of a sad thing that they don't understand maybe where, you know, milk or even just the ice cream comes from. And you say, okay, where would you get ice cream from? They're going to say the store or Brahm, especially for here in Oklahoma. But before that, where does it come from? Mmm, good. It might be. So, this is the winning coloring sheet. 
sheet that's going to be turned into a bookmark. And it's colored by a student right here at Orvis Riser Elementary. Jada Hutchinson, come on down. We don't just have a student winner, we have a teacher winner. Guess what? Miss Deskin is the state ag in the classroom teacher of the What makes Ms. Deskin so successful is her excitement and her enthusiasm. It's contagious. She is genuinely excited to teach the students. She can tell her class loves her. She takes that enthusiasm into the classroom. She expands on their regular learning experiences so that they love coming to school, they love learning. And then she takes that enthusiasm to other teachers. So when she presents at our State Ag in the Classroom conferences, her excitement and enthusiasm is broadcast into everyone that comes in contact with her. And then the message of agriculture spreads throughout the state. So we're so excited that she is going to be representing us for the next year as our State Ag and Classroom Teacher of the Year. And we're excited that she'll be joining us this summer on our road trips and being able to share more knowledge with more teachers. Don't be part of the problem. Be part of the solution. Well, being recognized as one of Oklahoma's top Ag in the Classroom teachers is no small feat. But one teacher in Morrison, Oklahoma, took it to the next level. <laughs> this has been one, the National Ag in the Classroom Teacher of the Year Award. Amber Bell is a Morrison Elementary School teacher, and last year's winner of the state Ag Teacher of the Year Award was one of eight teachers from around the country to take home the national prize. For two decades, she's found many ways to work agriculture into her students' everyday active learning. Being third grade, we need to have activities that the kids can relate to and have fun with and not just sitting at our desk all the time. So up and around movement um, and integrating that across the curriculum. Just my job um, to teach all students, regardless if they on live on a farm or just in our rural setting where our food comes from and the importance of that and conservation and our resources and those kind of things. Now Amber furthers that agricultural focus by organizing an annual school-wide food drive. She also started a Morrison Farmer's Market and takes care of the school's fruit trees. Now when we return, the art in agriculture. You're watching Oklahoma Horizon with Rob McClendon. Weekly insight into your changing world. Well, each year Ag in the Classroom recognizes not only teachers, but students as well in a statewide art contest celebrating agriculture. And there's one art class in Lindsay, Oklahoma, which has consistently had its students place in the top spots in these competitions. Our Blaine Singletary went to meet the teacher behind the art. In Robin Blau's class at Lindsay Elementary School, AITC doesn't just stand for Ag in the Classroom, it also stands for Art in the Classroom. We made clay chickens. They uh, were given a water clay and they made it into a shape of a sphere or an oval. These clay chickens are just one of the clay projects students from all different grades are doing today and Robin says they can't wait to get their hands dirty. Some of them will do better in clay than they can drawing. The kids love clay. That's all I hear all year long, can we do clay? Each class and grade at Lindsay Elementary has a period of art with Ms. Blau every week. And clay pottery is just one of the many projects that make this a class they look forward to. My goal as a teacher is obvious to teach them the elements and principles of art, but to do projects that, that they would have the love of art if you don't make it fun, they're not going to stay in art. And this artistic passion is important even outside of art class. It takes effort and it takes desire to create something great. It's something you can't just lop down. It teaches them that you have to put in effort in everything that you do. And also it helps kids that struggle sometimes. It helps them to realize that I can do it. I'm amazed at some of the things that kids can do. 
And so are the students' primary teachers, like Sandra Pratt, who sometimes like to join in on the fun. Mrs. Blau is an amazing art teacher that she, she works with them and they, they learn a lot from her through the years. So I like to sit in every now and then and get some art. Ms. Pratt also sees firsthand the benefits that art brings. It stimulates the, the creative part of your brain. It gives kids um, the ability to see, do, and follow through on what they're doing. It lets them use their imaginations. It's, it's totally up to them what it looks like. There's the steps that you follow, but then the kids go from there and do their own thing. As these kids are working on clay chickens and pinch pot animals, they are connecting with agriculture. That connection is furthered in yearly statewide art contests held by Oklahoma Ag in the classroom. And Lindsay Elementary is something of a major player when it comes to this. This year, students at this school alone took home five awards in categories including the poster and coloring contests. Sherry Long works with the State Department of Agriculture, Food and Forestry and says having a good coach helps. It's an awesome honor for that many students to be a winner, but we're very, very proud and pleased and honored to have uh, Ms. Blau as their teacher because she not only teaches agriculture to the students and spends a whole day talking about that, but then she teaches them the concepts of art and then bringing that all together. She does a really good job uh, with the students and it's evident in their artwork. After spending that day talking about agriculture, Ms. Blau lets the students brainstorm and come up with the poster elements and design themselves using what they've learned previously about the principles of art and design. If you listen and do the elements of art and you can put that in your picture, you're, a lot of them is going to end up with an awesome poster. In fact, one student, Chelsea White, has placed three years in a row in the poster contest, and this year her brother, Dustin, managed to take first. And with Ag in the classroom, these finely honed skills have a readily apparent real-world connection. The real-world application helps the kids to make that connection between agriculture and what they eat, sleep, and breathe every day. And Ms. Blau says these wins are just the icing on the cake. I don't know. I have so many talented kids. That's what's so neat about art. It floors me how well some of these kids can draw. It's really awesome. It's awesome every week to see what they do. I go home sometimes thinking they can do better than I can. <laughs> Still to come on Oklahoma Horizon. So who is the original Siri? Okay, I found this. But first, Oklahoma's capital restoration. Well, a mild winter has been a big help for the renovation going on at 23rd and Lincoln. In our continuing look at Oklahoma's capital restoration project, we look at just some of the work underway behind the scaffolding and tarps surrounding parts of the state capitol. So the majority of the restoration activities that we have on site require the temperatures to be between 40 and 90 degrees. That includes the repointing of the stone, that's the stone repairs, the Dutchman repairs that we're doing, as well as the window repairs themselves. We've made significant progress on installing the tarps around each of the scaffold systems that we have. We have exhaust fans that feed into each of the elevations, as well as heating and cooling ductwork depending on the season. Internally, we have smart boxes that we're able to use that notify us of the temperatures when they drop below a certain degree point. By doing that, we can make sure that the work that we're putting in place is up to spec and make sure that it lasts for a long period of time. During the initial phase of work for our stonemasons on the project, one of the first things they do is grind or rake the joints to get rid of the old deteriorated mortar. Through the process of doing that, this, the original wing tip that was located here failed. And from about here to here, it fell off. So what we've done here is put in place a Dutchman repair. We completely demo out the wing tip that failed during raking. From there, we create a template for the Dutchman blank piece that's set into place. And from there, we have one of our master stone masons come in and carve the piece of stone to what it originally looked like. And this is one of the pieces of stone that was removed from this elevation here. What you see up here on this elevation, there will be a new piece of stone that's basically put into place. Right now, we're at the top of the Capitol. 
basically the roof levels up here. This is the parapet. This is the old gutter. We were repairing the gutters that are up here with a whole new gutter system. We're putting in marine grade plywood, coating it in paint that will keep water from rotting out this wood. And then it'll get a copper infill to have a nice, good looking finish that will help any rainwater that gets up here flow to the roof drains and down into the storm sewer system. You can see the stainless steel through wall flashing that we're installing. We remove the stones and then we install this new through wall flashing stainless steel to keep any rainwater that blows in here to run down into the new gutter and keep it away from the building and out, out of the tenant space. Echo is the east side of the Capitol. We've uh, started scaffold erection. It's a main entrance for a lot of the public and uh, the Capitol employees. Uh, we're building tunnels so that they can safely get in and out of the building without affecting our work and without us affecting what they do every day. Where we're standing now is right where the main west entry corridor used to be. We've demolished everything in this west area of the basement. Now that everything has been removed, we've started cutting up the slab, trenching for utilities, and began the infrastructure portion of the project. We ran actually 16 four-inch conduits underground uh, to the main electrical room, and that'll be the main service feed, that'll be the generator emergency feed. Um, so every bit of power coming into the building, that's where it starts at. On the north side here, you have the main sanitary sewer piping. That was one of the very major concerns for the building. It was just failing due to its age. We're 90% complete with the demolition of this shaftway. Obviously, there's no elevator shaft here. There's no elevator cab, no rails. All those components are now gone. So we will actually concentrate on this east side of the shaft and we'll cut out all the old structural components and we'll actually build back new steel structural components uh, to reestablish the side of the elevator shaft. This room will become one of the most important rooms in the building. Uh, this is actually where we're gonna house the emergency generator. So what you see here on the wall is actually a scan of the existing wall structure. So we mapped out the reinforcing, sent the information to the structural engineer because this is actually where we're gonna cut a hole in this perimeter wall um, to build both a new generator area way for the air intake and exhaust systems for the generator. And that's also how we're gonna get the generator into the building. The generator will provide life safety backup. It'll ensure that server rooms are supported so that the state's IT network never goes down. Um, and it'll provide heating and cooling to this building regardless of what's going on in the outside world. This generator will truly make this building functional um, 365 days a year. Horizon is at your fingertips. Join us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube to catch the segments you may have missed and our latest new content as it happens. Well, for the past several years, my next guest has been a pocket or purse accessory for millions of Americans. And while sometimes frustrating, she can also be quite helpful. I was able to sit down with Susan Bennett, the original voice of Siri. So, Susan, how does it feel to be the most talked to person on the planet? It's a little odd, actually. You know, it, when I first found out years ago, it was kind of creepy. And I did not speak to Siri myself. Yeah. It was just too weird to have my own voice coming back out here. I talked to myself enough as it is. So how did all this happen? I don't know. I really don't know. I don't know how my voice was chosen, uh, when or by whom, because uh, Siri was not actually created by Apple. It was created by three engineers. So it could have been these guys that chose my voice, could have been a team at Apple, or could, be, could have been Steve Jobs himself, because he was very involved in the development of Siri. So you had gone in to do some voice work. Right. And tell me, for people that don't know, how, how voice artists work. You record a whole bunch of things, correct? Yes. Actually, um, you know, these days and for many, many years now, most of us who are doing it professionally have our own uh, booths at home. And so all of the Siri stuff was basically recorded from my house. And uh, to a company called Nuance, which was a text-to-speech company, they do a lot of GPS voices and that sort of thing. And, yeah, I thought I was just doing some more, you know, phone-type messaging. And then all of a sudden, a few years later, boom, there's Siri. So how did you find out? How did I find out? A friend who is a fellow voice actor emailed me and said, hey, we're playing around with this new iPhone app. Isn't this you? Siri, tell me about Susan Bennett. Here is what I found. Susan Bennett is an American voiceover artist. And I went, 
really? So I went on the Apple side and listened. So you were the original English speaking Siri, mm -hmm. but there's other series around the world. Right. Um, there's a process called concatenation. Um, when the recordings are done, after the recordings are done, uh, technicians and computers go in and extract sounds, put them back together, and those sentences are what become, you know, series answers. Say fluff C Ethel today. Say C S fluster today. And after the recordings were done, technicians went in and extracted sounds and reformed new phrases and sentences. And these are what ended up on the digital devices. This process is called concatenation. So it's the programmers that determine everything Siri says. But during all those recordings, um, we're just reading all kinds of, of crazy things to get all the sounds in the language. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, basically the voices, we had really no, no idea exactly what we were doing. But in order to make the concatenated voice sound more natural, of course they would have to have the native, uh, a voice actor who was a native speaker for whatever, you know, country the phone was going into. So you're a musician at heart. How mm -hmm. does voice work differ from being a musician? Well, it's definitely related. You definitely, you know, you're using your voice and you have to have learned certain skills for certain things. But I got into voiceover because of music. I used to uh, sing a lot of uh, backup vocals for people and uh, I sang lead on a lot of jingles and things made for radio and TV commercials. One day um, uh, I had sung on something and the voice actor didn't show up to read the copy for the spot. So the studio owner said, Susan, you don't have an accent. Come over here and read this copy. And I went, oh. I can do this. Yeah. So and then started, a career began. Yeah. Yeah. It was sort of a, a very happy accident. So when I think of Siri, I think of this quirky personality. Does that mirror yours? <laughs> well, I don't know. You might, you know, you might say so. Um, yeah. Very coy sometimes too. Oh, yes. yeah. 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 She's pretty funny. Give me your take on, on just the type of jobs that are out there for people that do what you do. Well, um, there are a lot of opportunities, and because of the technology, there is a lot of competition, too. Because basically, you know, if you have an iPhone, a mixer face, and a microphone, and a closet, you have a recording studio. <laughs> so, so, you know, anybody that really wants to do it can do it now for a fairly, you know, reasonable price. And so there's a lot of competition. As with everything um, that was, you know, instigated by technology, you know, just the, just the widespread use of internet and everything, um, it's up to the individual person now more than it was in the past. In the past, you'd have an agent who was your, ad, you know, advocate. And now it's basically up to the individual. If you want to have this job, you've got to go out there and find the work. So people can hear you, not just on their iPhone, too, mm -hmm. in any number of places? Well, probably the most uh, obvious place is I'm the voice of Delta Airlines Gates worldwide. So I'm the one who tells you what zone you're in. Now calling Zone 1. Thank you for flying Delta Airlines. So if I'm frantically trying to find my gate, that you're mm -hmm. who I'm listening to? Yes. Okay. To say, so sorry, you missed your plane. <laughs> <laughs> Haven't heard that in a while, thankfully. Yeah, yeah, I do a lot of radio and TV commercials, and I do a lot of things that are Siri-like. You know, I was on um, the Mariah Carey Christmas special playing the GPS voice. And uh, so I've had a lot of fun opportunities because of Siri. If there was one thing that you would like to have known when you just started off doing this that you know now, what is it? Well, um... The basics are, are still the same, you know, uh, with all the technology that we have and the, you know, voice, you know, voice changing things and Photoshop and everything, you can present yourself as one thing, but when you show up to do the job, you better be, you better have the goods. So the bottom line is you still need to be good at what you do, you know, which is to read well. And of course, a lot of voice actors come from uh, acting and music, radio, things like that. And so it's sort of a natural progression for people in those businesses. But anyone who wants to just start out from scratch, you know, improve your reading ability <laughs> and your acting ability. <laughs> so I'll leave you with my final question, which is you've probably heard a thousand times. Okay. All right, say something Siri like for me. What are you wearing? There you go. <laughs> Susan Bennett, thank you so much. Thank you. Susan was in Oklahoma to speak to the Business Professionals of America, one of seven career tech student organizations. Want to see more stories like this? 
All our segments are streaming on our YouTube channel at Oklahoma Horizon TV. It'll be four years this May when Canadian Valley Technology Center's El Reno campus was destroyed by the largest tornado on record. Next time on Oklahoma Horizon, we look at the strength and resilience of the faculty, students, and the community that helped rebuild the school. Canadian Valley Strong on Oklahoma Show Over the Heartland, Oklahoma Horizon. Well, that is going to wrap us up for this broadcast edition of Horizon, but you can find us online all the time at okhorizon.com. Thanks for including us as part of your day. I'm Rob McClendon. Hope to see you back here next week. Thank <laughs> you.